It is Friday, January 12th. Let's talk PlayStation. Welcome back, everyone, to another Spellbinding episode of LTPS. Uh, a lot going on from this past week, a lot of stories. So uh, first, as always, a quick reminder for PS Plus Essential. The January games are still live on PSN. Make sure you claim those. And also, we have the lineup for uh, PS Plus Extra and Premium going live on the 16th, which uh, only nine titles for Extra. That is on the shorter side, but still, you know, something where quality over quantity. So uh, we have Tiny Tina's Wonderlands, Resident Evil 2, uh, Lego City Under cover if you're into the lego games uh just cause 3 session skate sim i hear a lot of good things about that uh also vampire the masquerade swan song so we're finally getting bloodlines 2 this year apparently so if you've not tried the uh vampire masquerade uh franchise that's a good way to jump in but uh going over to premium we have five titles, which that's on the higher end as far as premium goes, but uh, Rally Cross PS1, Star Wars Episode One, The Phantom Menace PS1, gotta have that Disney representation on here. Uh, also Street Fighter, the 30th anniversary edition for PS4, Legend of Mana PS4, and Secret of Mana PS4 as well. So we are seeing more uh, native PS4 remasters that are getting added on the monthly lineup, which is not necessarily a bad thing, but they're leaning on that now, aside from more proper emulation titles but uh, in fairness, we did catch wind of one by accident where the PlayStation UK Twitter X account uh, and also PlayStation Access accidentally put this out a little bit early, but we do know that Alone in the Dark, uh, the new nightmare for PS1 is also coming at some point, probably close to when the new Alone in the Dark comes out. Um, so that might be how they're trying to line that up, but they just put that out there by mistake. Um, and there was a PS2 version only available in Europe, but this is very much the PS1 version we are getting because we all know the crux of the issue there, but uh, still not the worst uh, premium lineup and not exactly a bad extra lineup either, I would say. Now getting into our first news story, let's talk about Sony's CES 2024 presentation, where I had mentioned last week, don't expect anything too crazy. They don't usually have a major PlayStation presence at CES. Years ago, it was nothing. Nowadays, they do say something during the PS5 cycle. They kind of have to. It's their biggest division. Uh, but it's hit or miss, right? Uh, this time around, more miss. Uh, but as expected, there was some PS production stuff, so we can mention that. So every single announcement at CES uh, first was Torchlight, which is a brand new facility Sony announced, uh, which is primarily for uh, filmmakers, creatives, artists to, you know, test out or do mocap or 3D modeling, things like that for their projects. You know, a really big part of this presentation was about how Sony's making all these tools and facilities and hardware for creatives. Uh, and so during the presentation, we saw very brief footage of a live action gravity rush which up until now has been a rumor but now we can finally confirm the gravity rush uh adaptation is happening for certain uh which is somewhat humorous in a way right or i guess ironic right uh an ip that debuted on ps vita got a ps4 sequel then japan studio closed down but we already knew that uh in terms of ip and what they're adapting they're really letting anything you know, happen here so long as a pitch comes uh, knocking for any IP that they have and it makes sense. And so uh, now we can say Gravity Rush is on the way. However, uh, a really interesting thing happened. So the same clip for Torchlight was then uploaded to YouTube separately. And um, for whatever reason, there was an extra shot in there, uh, this time showing off Patapon, where it says IP development, gaming, and anime. Uh, in the background showing some footage as well, some what appears to be new footage. But uh, it, it's weird because uh, there was no formal announcement of this, right? Uh, also, we did not have any rumors about Patapon coming back in any uh, any meaningful way, but it says anime and also game, so that leads some to think that we're getting a, a Patapon animation and also a game. Um, I, I guess we can say maybe. Uh, we'll have to wait and see. It was a very weird thing how that appeared, but that's what we have for Patapon, which I, I will say that is a little bit, I guess disappointing in a way because we had the original Patapon creators, you know, <laughs> go off and do their own studio to make Rataton a spiritual successor and them going on record to say that they would like to revisit Patapon if, you know, because it's not their IP, right? They would have to get, you know, Sony's approval and be the ones to get the funding from Sony and everything. So that just, it, that seemed a little bit weird. But um, anyway, moving on, we also, um, 
saw for uh, PlayStation Productions that uh, writing is underway for God of War. That's going to be on Prime Video and also Horizon Zero Dawn on Netflix. Uh, so that's really, <laughs> that's all they said. They just said, oh, the writing is underway, uh, but we already knew about those two projects. Um, as for the PlayStation section proper, uh, no Jim Ryan, by the way, still Kenichiro Yoshida. Um, I would presume Jim Ryan's probably done in terms of uh, international travel. So considering he's only got a few months left. But um, Kenichiro Yoshida does say that December, uh, December last year had 123 million monthly active users, which is the highest for the company in its entire history. Um, for a frame of reference, it was 107 million the last quarter, or the last previous quarter, I should say. Um, and then it was 112 million from Q3 2022, which kind of would have been year over year. I mean, they're saying December, but Q3 would be three months uh, as a running average. But yeah, 123 million is still much higher than both of those numbers, uh, which means they had a lot of new PS5 consoles opened up, signed into PSN. And, uh, you know, between that peak of selling a lot of consoles and users uh, jumping in, uh, the existing user base, everybody from PS4, and that split is probably favoring PS4 more and more as days goes on. But uh, 123 million, it was interesting that that's the only sort of metric they really put out there for this uh, presentation. Now, uh, Yoshida-san then moves on to highlighting Gran Turismo Sophie, uh, and then he uh, plays a sizzle reel for PS5 games and accessories, uh, which FYI, there was a Helldivers 2 gameplay section shown off. It was a very brief thing, but uh, at the bottom it said the release was February 28th, uh, but that was a typo. The game is still coming out February 8th, so no delay there. But um, really, that was it for the dedicated PlayStation section. We got like nothing <laughs> just like one metric that is like not really useful for anybody that's really watching the conference outside of maybe an investor uh but yoshida did move on to announcing a new ar headset uh but that's again primarily for creators so if you saw that that's what that is uh and sure enough the rest of the presentation was focused on the sony honda mobility division which goes into the afila prototype vehicle that they're developing but this is where it gets weird they brought this thing out by controlling it with a dual sense so so there's your final uh, coup de grace PlayStation news from CES, uh, which they did say immediately that that's only for uh, showcase purposes, um, just highlighting the importance of, you know, software driven features and development considering modern cars are, you know, much more software driven than ever before. Um, and not completely relevant, but Sony Honda Mobility is also partnering with Microsoft for uh, generative AI integration with their uh, with Azure. So, thought that was also worth at least mentioning that you know other divisions of Sony, and uh, at least in terms of them working with Honda, um, they settled on Microsoft with that AI partnership. Uh, but we also saw that Polyphony Digital is getting involved with the development uh, the development of Afila, and uh, I believe the Afila is coming to Gran Turismo Seven as well. So, yeah, that's that's really all we had. CES, uh, kind of a big nothing burger for uh, PlayStation, but this was always a show that was never going to be a guarantee for major news. Now, I will say we did get one game-related announcement at CES, not from Sony, but from NVIDIA, where they had the privilege of showing off Horizon Forbidden West Complete Edition on PC, uh, where they just put out a, a very short clip uh, highlighting that uh, Forbidden West on PC is going to support NVIDIA DLSS3, DLAA, and Reflex, uh, and that's still expected early 2024, or right about now, so uh, we should be seeing a release date confirmed very soon. Not too surprising there, uh, considering Gorilla and Nixa Software, they want to be on the, the cutting edge, so uh, to see that game supporting all those uh, more modern PC features obviously a, a great addition if you're looking to play that game on PC and still something where if you're primarily on console that might give us some decent insight into the sort of development that will go into the possibility of a PS5 Pro or long-term PlayStation 6. In-house, you know, first-party studios are always going to be uh, deeply involved in that creative process of developing the hardware. During the PS3 days, it was much more secretive. The, you know, Japan headquarters would make that thing, then tell studios this is what it is. Now there's more of a dialogue between, well, from PS4 development onward, now there's more of a dialogue between uh, first party and third party studios shaping that hardware. So uh, looking at these PC versions, it's always something worth, you know, considering when we talk about what we can expect going into PS5 Pro and PlayStation 6. 
Now, one final CES news story is we saw some real life photos of the Deep Earth Collection PS5 console covers for the new PS5 model. And uh, folks, I'll tell you, they look absolutely gorgeous. My God, uh, the lighting probably is doing uh, you know a lot of work here with really showing off the uh, pearlescent finish on the Deep Earth Collection, which is very evident from the controllers if you do have one of the uh, controllers. But at least as far as the console covers go, uh, they look gorgeous, uh, blue, red, silver. The silver, I will say, it looks a little bit reminiscent of, and probably in lower lighting conditions, it, mu it might look a bit more reminiscent of uh, you know a PS1 style gray, which uh, the other thing to point out here is that because these are on the new PS5, it's worth mentioning that if you don't like the uh, glossy top panel, which is more reminiscent of the original PS4 model, if you don't like that, then we can clearly see that every panel on the Deep Earth Collection is a matte finish. So if you don't like that and you also want a different color and these colors appeal to you, then I think these are a great option. Uh, we should be seeing more info about when these are releasing uh, here in the West. Moving on to our next news story, we did get some news on Helldivers 2, though. Unrelated to its release date announcement, that was still the same date. Uh, they confirmed that crossplay is coming, which is a little weird because I, I feel like that was kind of a given, but they did put out a, a new trailer and uh, a post on the PlayStation blog confirming that, yes, day one, PC, PS5 players, uh, the game does support crossplay uh, right away. Uh, Arrowhead also detailed the minimum to ultra spec sheet for the PC version, uh, the minimum being a GTX 1050 or Radeon RX 470 uh, space requirement, 100 gigs, at least uh, a hard disk drive. Uh, they're recommending 7,200 RPM. So uh, still <laughs> PC games have those ballooning file sizes, just like console, but uh, at least you can, because the game does appear uh, somewhat modest uh, in terms of uh, visual presentation, I guess we could say the game is seemingly not doing anything crazy like, say, Ratchet. So um, in that sense, it seems like it's uh, a, a good minimum for people to jump into. Now, moving on to a very unfortunate situation going on in the Little Big Planet community, where uh, this past week a number of users were reporting their PSN accounts were getting banned for uh, seemingly no reason, uh, but the reason being sent to their email was that uh, they apparently published some kind of inappropriate or explicit content on LBP, even though they might have not even played the game recently. So, uh, what's going on here? So, what we're hearing about is that there's been some users in the community that have been exploiting the good grief feature in game to then have have the suspensions automatically delivered. Uh, and it seems like that didn't take very long for community management to at least be made aware of the issue. Uh, so in the meantime, the servers have already been taken offline while they look into the new issues. And uh, also the suspensions so far given out have been lifted. So good to see a swift response uh, in terms of managing the community and making sure that users are uh, set right with their suspensions because obviously it's um, you know a terrible circumstance when that happens. We just had a situation Situation where a bunch of PSN accounts were banned in mass. Sony never said anything about that, but at least on a game by game basis, we've seen that, you know, in this example, they're doing uh, the right thing, which um, with LBP, we do know we had a problem before with this, right? On LBP 1, 2, 3 on PlayStation 3 and also on PS Vita, where that was again a, a circumstance of bad actors in the community messing with the, uh, the servers and modifying the game, and that led to the servers being taken offline. And then uh, they were down for a long time until they finally uh, figured figured out what the solution was, and the solution was keeping those games offline. We lost all those servers on PS3 and PS Vita, and now the only remaining OG LBP game is uh, LBP on PlayStation 4. So uh, this is the result of, of bad actors in the community. They're the absolute worst. It really, really sucks when something like this happens. and. Uh, even more so because when, when this happens, right, to older games, it's really tough for the studio or whatever sort of skeleton crew is managing that game, uh, assuming it's not a high priority project that they're just kind of, you know, keeping keeping on, right? Uh, but they're not necessarily adding new content. The game is considered legacy. That puts a lot of unnecessary strain on those those games. So they're, they're always at risk for being taken offline because the financial... Uh, upkeep or at least trying to adjust or make changes to that legacy software, that, that's an issue, right? So it's always a, a little bit scary when you do have exploits or you know something like this that pops up and there are going to be people that take advantage of that situation. So uh, for now, we'll watch this, see what happens. But uh, the one good, good thing about this is that 
uh, there was a very swift response in setting users right, and uh, hopefully the servers are back online soon. Next up, one of our big headline news stories from this past week is about getting more Xbox games on PlayStation and Nintendo, and it would not be under any kind of contractual obligation. It's just rumors about Microsoft wanting to ship more games uh, on competing platforms, just willingly. So this was uh, from a number of places all in sequence here. So we'll run through this one by one and get you brought up to speed on what's going on. So this all began initially from Nate the Hate speaking with MVG on his channel for an Xbox 2024 predictions podcast. Nate has previously been privy to a number of business dealings within the game's business. So Nate says outright during this uh, conversation that he knows of one highly acclaimed Xbox Game Studios title that will be coming to a competing platform. And that's where he leaves it. He really does not say much else but this you know initially led to early speculation about maybe hi-fi rush uh, or pentiment coming to nintendo switch considering microsoft has shipped ori on the switch before albeit that was a different publisher but that's one of those outliers of allowing the game on a competing platform without it being a contractual obligation so to many switch seemed like the good candidate for that uh, you know that possibility However, over on Reset Era, on a thread discussing this news, the user Lolilo Lilo, whom has shared information prior about Microsoft's relationship with Atlas and Persona for Game Pass, they put out there that they had known about Hi-Fi Rush being in development for Switch and PS5, but apparently plans may have changed in favor of dropping Switch and only doing a PS5 one. Shortly after this, Jez Corden of Windows Central put out a report discussing the rumors and mentions that it's been suggested to him from proven sources that Microsoft is exploring bringing back catalog titles to other platforms, but he makes it clear that the details remain vague and unconfirmed. Then we had Jeff Grubb of Giant Bomb talking about this during their Game Mess Morning show. Jeff says he's heard about Sea of Thieves coming to both Switch and PlayStation. Then we had Steven Totillo, now publishing independently for his own newsletter called GameFile. He put out a report claiming Microsoft is indeed looking into bringing Sea of Thieves to PlayStation in early 2024, but he was unable to corroborate a Switch version. So that's where we're at right now. And uh, it's funny because you've got one person here that made, made a very ambiguous statement, but not so ambiguous that we can't, you know, pin down two or three games where it makes sense on the two other competing platforms. So... You know, we, we have that, and then that was enough for other people that heard something similar to say, oh, well, here's what I heard, and now games are being named, platforms are being named, Sea of Thieves, Hi-Fi Rush, well, I've heard Switch, I've heard Switch on PS5, I've heard Switch being dropped, so... I think it would be safe to say that, like, when there's smoke, there's fire. And uh, this isn't exactly shocking news, I would say, uh, given the context of, you know, Microsoft uh, being in recent years the most platform agnostic of all three, which, you know, would make sense. They've always been trying to, as I like to say, carve out their own path uh, for their business profile, right? That's not as traditional as Sony or, micro or Sony and Nintendo, I should say. Um, you know, uh, aggressively pursuing subscription, which kind of goes into this, right? It's a matter of like, we know they wanted to get Game Pass on PlayStation and Nintendo. My overall thinking when I saw these rumors uh, really uh, heating up was that, well, it's probably a combo of two uh, things here, which is, you, you know, Microsoft is probably not going to do something unless they feel like, you know, we've sort of exhausted other options that would have been more lucrative for us. That would have been getting Game Pass on competing platforms, right? So with Sony and Nintendo not being receptive, it's a matter of, okay, well, let's explore the back catalog and see what kind of games would make sense to ship on those other uh, those other systems. Because that's the other thing about this, right? I mean, at least in the diehard Xbox community, it's a matter of like, oh no, I mean, what does this mean? What Does this mean eventually they're going to ship other big AAA titles over? Are they giving up? Are they going third party? No, I don't find that to be the case, right? I mean, Microsoft can do this and benefit the most from it because they are number three, so to speak, right? They have the most to gain from, say, shipping on a competing platform, at least in terms of like, from a business standpoint, the, the actual balance sheet, making money, which is what they're in the business of doing at some point or another, um, you know, they, they stand to reap the most reward, right? Because the, the question I always see counter to this is, why doesn't PlayStation do that for, you know, games on Xbox? Why doesn't Nintendo do it? But they have a much a much larger footprint, right? So, I mean, they stand to gain more from uh, keeping a tighter ecosystem with their large player base. Having said that, uh, you know, Microsoft being the most platform agnostic, maybe not having much uh, progress on Game Pass for competing platforms. And I I mean, I, I feel like it's got to be something where they're probably getting a little bit of corporate pressure 
above Xbox, right? You know, above Phil Spencer. At a certain point, something has to give. I, I think I said this a long time ago where it's like, they can lost lead for a long time. Microsoft as the parent organization, you know, they can do that for Game Pass. Now apparently Game Pass is, uh, you know, uh, penciling out. So that's good, obviously. But they're still missing some some very big uh, KPIs behind the scenes, right? With Xbox consoles this this generation, um, you know, revenue for, for games and services. And, and uh, there's a few numbers that they're not hitting or it's down year over year. And, you know, something has to give. So I, I also feel like maybe there's a little bit of corporate pressure to, you know, not... You, go crazy and ship all these games everywhere, but start identifying games on a case by case basis, which is the language we saw when they acquired Bethesda, right? As a, you know, they'll be looking at certain games and identifying where it would make sense to maybe ship that on a competing platform. So, you know, Sea of Thieves being live service, okay, kind of like a Fallout 76, uh, Hi-Fi Rush, I'm sure that game did not do crazy in terms of a la carte sales, and, uh, you know, it probably saturated with the amount of penetration it was going to get from, you know, Game Pass adoption, so it would be probably very beneficial to get that game on Nintendo or PlayStation, so... That's that's kind of where I fall on this. I don't think it's necessarily bad news for Xbox, uh, and clearly it would be good news for somebody that's playing on a, a different machine. That way they don't have to buy an Xbox, right? But it's one of those things where they, they do have the most to, to gain from this on that case-by-case -case basis. And going back to Jez's report, you know, he had mentioned that as far as he's heard, you know, for high-profile Xbox Game Studio titles, you know, we're talking Elder Scrolls VI, Avowed, um, Indiana Jones, I think, was the other one he named, but those are all still apparently planned for uh, Xbox exclusivity, but he's hearing about back catalog titles, so um, titles that have already saturated on the console and, and done what they can on Xbox and PC, and so, you know, let's, let's do a little more of these titles. So, and what we saw recently was As Dusk Falls also coming to PlayStation. I don't even think we mentioned that as a news story, but that was a title published by Xbox Game Studios and they own that IP. But whatever the contract was for that game, it seems like they are allowing it to go elsewhere. They're just letting another publisher step in and do it on PlayStation. So uh, we might be seeing, you know, Xbox sto uh, sort of stay true to their word of, uh, doing this on a case-by-case -case basis. And that means it might be a lot more interesting as we look at, you know, uh, future Activision Blizzard titles, um, presuming that they might, you know, still stick with some day-and-date stuff outside of Call of Duty, but that remains to be seen. Now, since we're on a similar topic here, the Xbox console exclusive Immortality was recently confirmed for PlayStation. So Immortality coming to uh, PlayStation 5 with proper DualSense support and a full trophy list with a Platinum coming out January 23rd. Uh, this is one uh, very cool interactive sort of game experience that has been uh, very uh, critically acclaimed, widely uh, well received, and so cool to see that game come over as well. Um, and that's, uh, I guess, a good segue into the other news story, which is we saw a tease from uh, the Spyro account on Twitter X where they put up this image and all it says is um, uh, you got to believe with the it says up top 2024 motto. So there's been some rumors for a, a bit now that we could possibly see a, a proper new entry in the Spyro franchise. ABK now being under Microsoft ownership, that's something where as a cautionary sort of thing, we should expect that they'll probably be shipping that uh, under Xbox exclusivity, but maybe that's going to change nowadays so for now we'll uh watch uh we'll watch this because at least for me i i've always been more of a spyro guy versus say crash bandicoot but uh between the two of them we'll still see where this goes Moving on to our next news story, this one being not nearly as surprising or thought-provoking, but uh, we might not have to wait too long for the first state of play of 2024, according to Jeff Grubb of Giant Bomb speaking during a recent episode of the Giant Bomb cast, where he simply said uh, a state of play is coming in the next few weeks, so probably late January, early February. Um, the timing makes perfect sense, considering there's so much stuff coming in the short term, and state of play does tend to be a stage for uh, a number of short-term, short to term short term announcements for like the year that it's in 
and they typically do one around like Q1 anyway, right? Sometime in Q1. Uh, and there's a number of things we could we could possibly hear about based on the timing. So, you know, it could be more FF7 Rebirth, Rise of the Ronin, uh, Grand Blue Fantasy Relink, Helldivers 2, Pacific Drive. Um, the Bluebird team CEO recently mentioned that they think they're uh, they think the marketing campaign for Silent Hill 2 will be starting soon which that's always like a two, three month, uh, a two, three month buffer from, you know, when the game is actually going to ship. So that would be the perfect time to showcase Silent Hill 2 and talk about the release date. Uh, and also the great thing about State of Plays is that when Sony does announce them, they've been outlining on the PS blog what to expect. Like, hey, don't expect PS Studios, uh, or it's going to be primarily uh, announcements from third party or PS VR 2. So yeah, I, I think we won't have to wait too long. Uh, just that when they do announce it, it's probably going to be something where it's on a Tuesday, then for a Thursday. So it usually won't be that long of a delta from confirmation to the um, to the actual presentation. But yeah, there's a number of things they can talk about. Maybe, just maybe, we will find out what's going on with Little Devil and Sun. Uh, I just I, I pray that that game is not vaporware. I want to see more of it. Now let's talk about this DualSense version 2 thing going on because there's something a little bit strange about this whole thing. So you might have already seen this because this was a very big story this week. It was widely reported on that there's uh, potentially a new DualSense coming out with improved battery life. Uh, what happened here was a listing on Best Buy Canada went live where it plainly says DualSense V2. Looks the same, uh, but the product bullet points mention exceptional 12-hour battery life, uh, which, you know, that's kind of... People are poking fun at that. That doesn't sound like it's very exceptional, but in terms of the overall mileage for a lot of people, they tend to get, you know, six hours on the low end, upwards of eight, maybe 10 hours on the high end for existing DualSense controllers. But anyway, it says that, and then also um, that, it, that it includes the DualSense charging station as well, and then the price is $89.99 Canadian, which is the same as the existing non-colored controllers in Canada, um, and uh, it does say it's out of stock. So some thinking that maybe they put the listing up too early. Now that listing is gone, by the way. Uh, so what's going on here? Now, I'm not entirely convinced this is a brand new controller or that they're doing this. Or rather, I, I should say if they are doing this, maybe it's a, like way too soon. It's really strange because... Um, a lot of folks really were diving into like the product dimensions uh, listed on the page or the um, actual milliamp hours listed for the battery and like everything's actually the same. Yeah, you know, people are getting con confused with um, the the box dimensions uh, in comparison to the actual controller dimensions, but the box size the same. So it's not something where they're, you know, making the controller smaller or they're including the charging station. I don't know why that has this listing and it's the same price. That seems like probably the biggest issue with this uh, particular listing, but the weight is the same. Um, we had version two listings actually pop up not too long ago, last month in, uh, I think it was like Denmark or something. It was international. So uh, obviously it didn't seem to uh, cause much of a stir up until we had this listing pop up in the West. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's a little weird. I, I just, I don't know if we actually have a, a new controller just yet, especially because I remember, I don't know. Well, not like well, but like, I, I think Sony did initially quote the dual sense battery life very optimistically as 12 hours. So it might just be the same sort of bullet points or whatever. Um, I mean, really, if you try to find Sony quoting a number, they just don't because it's an embarrassing number. And that's, what's funny about this is that, um, you know, it says exceptional 12 hour battery life, but everyone's like, well, that's not what we're getting. So clearly that mu this must be a new controller. <laughs> um, uh, and in the grand scheme of things, we've already had like three, four variations of the dual sense, which that's the other conflicting part of the story is that we just had a new revision of the dual sense, uh, as part of the, um, the recent PS five, uh, slim models, CFI, uh, the CFI 2000 series. Right. So, um, between that, like, like a real version two of the dual sense was when it was back in like 2021, uh, or I think early 2022, where they changed the, the mechanism for the adaptive triggers. So it's a little bit more, um, reliable and not receptive to cracking or breaking or whatever the case is. But the point is, um, if you saw this, I just don't really know if this is for sure a brand new controller. But having said that, it would be nice if they do expand uh, the, the standard battery inside DualSense controllers moving forward. So I guess we will watch this one and see what happens.
Now, another uh, funny news story, or at least I thought this was worth pointing out, is that uh, PlayStation 5 and 4 sales in the UK, this was recently uh, reported by GamesIndustry.biz, citing the GFK, which tracks video game sales data in the UK. Uh, we had heard about some you know, met metrics for console and game sales uh, throughout all of 2023. Uh, yada, 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 PS5 still doing well. It's up 55% from 2022. The actual news, though, is that PS4 was up 633% which is insane now that's working off percentages so when you're working off of you know 2022 supply being like hardly anything and not many people are buying ps4s very easy to get a, a crazy percentage increase when it's only you know how many more compared to the outgoing year but still that's i guess enough to still say that's a sizable amount of ps4s um and still something where i think uh, I believe the company is still manufacturing PS4s. If you remember, I bought a PS4 brand new to sort of check the manufacture date on the console, and that one was from, what was that, September 2022, I think? I can't remember exactly <laughs> now that I think about it, but uh, yeah, that console was manufactured uh, not too long ago, and it seems like they're still making a very small amount of base PS4 consoles, even though they're obviously not moving nearly as much, but that was still, I think, enough to mention this as a, a news story. Now let's talk about The Last of Us HBO show. A lot going on here where uh, this past week, most notably, the show won eight awards at the Emmys, uh, all for outstanding in a uh, drama series. That would be outstanding uh, prosthetic makeup, special visual effects, main title design, um, sound editing, sound mixing, uh, also outstanding guest actress and guest actor in a drama series went to Storm Reid as Riley and Nick Offerman as Bill. They both did absolutely incredible work, uh, more so for for, you know, uh, Nick Offerman, of course, really taking that character and being able to tell uh, a very different story from the, the game and doing it in a, in a wonderful way. Apparently, uh, Nick was actually uh, pitching an idea for a miniseries to HBO about that or something, trying to get it off to do its own little thing and explore more of, you know, Frank and Bill's uh, relationship. But he mentioned that's like above his pay grade. So it sounded like maybe that wasn't going anywhere. But uh, either way, Still very well deserved, uh, and what's also interesting is that they won eight awards at the Emmys, but nothing at the Golden Globe. So, you know, that's how these things play out sometimes. But uh, we do also have major cast announcements for season two. Those season two characters, uh, we got some confirmed ones. And uh, Young Mazzino is playing Jesse. Isabella Merced is playing Dina. And Caitlin Dever, previously rumored but now confirmed, is going to be playing as Abby. And that sounds like a good lineup to me. I don't feel too strongly one way or the other about um, if it's good or bad. Just I'm ready for this thing to go into production and then watch it sometime early 2025. So still going to be a while. But uh, I will say it's actually like a huge disappointment to know that like it is genuine good advice that's being spread of like, oh, Caitlin Dever, she'll have to turn off social media or something like that probably is being advised to her right now behind the scenes is that, hey, there, this character that you're walking into, I mean, this might be an issue for you. Absolute tragedy that that actually does have to be a thing since there are so many weirdos out there. But, um, you know, I, I think she'll be able to handle herself, hopefully, right? That's the, um, the, the thing you hope for out of any kind of circumstance like this comes with the territory for uh, the field where you step into a, an existing property. But uh, either way, uh, still looking forward to season two. Now, we would be remiss to not bring up this other news story, which was very important, and that is a new development in the possibility of AI being used in video game development because uh, what happened during CES, kind of another CES news story, but uh, SAG-AFTRA, the Screen Actors Guild, and also Replica Studios, which is a voice AI technology company, uh, they reached some kind of agreement for uh, the ethical use of being able to adopt a voice actor's talent into AI for then putting that into a video game. And so apparently it's some kind of consent package that the voice talent would agree to that includes fair compensation. And so very light on details, but what was so noteworthy about this is that not only is this being agreed upon, but, you know, a well-known uh, voice in the space, uh, no pun intended here, but Steve Blum, who has 30 years of experience, mentioned and responded to this on X saying that, you know, I was not part of this community engagement. I know a lot of people in this field, uh, in this field and nobody else knows about these conversations that took place and we didn't know about this deal being uh, you know, decided upon. So it, there's a little bit of drama there in terms of what this is going to mean long term because we don't have the exact details of 
the agreement at all for workers now in this space providing their their voice for um for uh ai and video and ai adoption in video games because it, it really is one of those very uh sketchy can of worm things once it's open you know it's it's going to go down it could go down a, ver a very bad path because there is an ethical way to adopt and use ai especially in video games where it's becoming very costly and a lot of studios are absolutely going to look at ways to keep their costs down labor is a big cost and so it does kind of become a conflict of interest with uh workers rights so we can't really say much else. I just, I, w I hope that this is going down a path of very much what they're talking about, but considering Steve's response, I don't know. It's, it's hard to be optimistic about it, but that's what happened recently. We'll keep following this and see what, um, see what develops. Now, with all that said, it is time for Let's Talk Plus, the weekly Let's Talk PlayStation giveaway where one of you can win a $10 PSN code. I would like to congratulate this viewer right here. I'll be contacting you very soon via email or X. And if you'd like to win a $10 PSN code, it is so simple. You can follow the link down below. Supporting this channel, a number of ways on Gleam can gain you an entry. And I'll announce the winner next week because I'm trying to help pay for your games. Those are all the stories from this past week that I wanted to talk about with you all, and our Tuesday video was 2024 PS5 games. If you want a very quick bird's eye view of all those titles with release dates, go check it out. Uh, we do that every year, but I normally try and get that out in December, so <laughs> 30 Platinums delayed a lot of uploads, so I still have a few other things I would like to get to. But we're behind on that. So I'm, I'm getting, I'm trying to catch up here. But um, that means we should also have something else on Tuesday uh, as per usual. But that is it. So uh, that concludes this week's episode of Let's Talk PlayStation. I'm Ryan Panecki. Thank you all so much for talking with me. And I will see you all next Friday.